Uh, I want to thank, thank the chairman and thank all of you for being here. I wanted to follow up on a couple of questions. First of all, um, to understand that we have not been vetting uh, the workers, the workforce against the uh, FBI database. Um, and then I, as I understood you, Mr. Roth, saying that, um, in fact, we still aren't able to fully do that because of uh, actually an access code issue. Could you let us know more about this? Because I have to say, I think all of us are quite shocked by this in terms of just basic common sense of uh, we use that the uh, FBI background checks on people who deal with the public in a variety of contexts. Um, and to not in this context just seems kind of mind boggling that that step wouldn't have been in place already. Yeah, to do this, a little context on what lists we're talking about. There is sort of the large list, the terrorist identity data mart environment, which has information of individuals that's both verified and unverified. So it is the broader list from which it gets called sort of the so-called terrorist watch list. Mm -hmm. So what TSA did not have access to is certain codes within that larger environment. Uh, again, some of this information is non-substantiated. Um, uh, once TSA realized, I think uh, around 2014, that they did not have this information, uh, Director Pistol or Administrator Pistol um, uh, uh, signed a letter uh, asking for that, and it's now sort of in that interagency uh, uh, environment in order to do it. Um, we were able to, in the course of our audit, run 900,000 names uh, against the TIDE database. So uh, as we sit now, I think we have some comfort in understanding what that environment looks like. In other words, the 73 uh, uh, individuals we believe is the sort of sum entirety of, of what was missed. Um, we gave those names uh, to TSA as soon as we discovered them, and I think they're following up on each of those. So, I mean, to the extent that there was a vulnerability, I, I believe it's been closed, but it certainly gives you pause that uh, this situation was allowed to continue. It does give you pause because it really only takes one versus 73 in this context. And um, as we sit here, even the fact that there's still a bureaucratic step that isn't being expedited with this request being made uh, by Director Pistole already in two, 2014, um, I just can't imagine that the FBI wouldn't have moved on this with the most haste that they could possibly move, uh, given especially your recent uh, undercover findings. Um, so I think that's something we should follow up on just as a matter of, uh, you know, bureaucracy can't hold this up when it comes to basic vetting that needs to be done. Also wanted to follow up um, on the managed inclusion, uh, what is being done with that. Um, and I was interested also to see Director Roaring refer to it as that pre-checked is being given out like Halloween candy in your uh, written testimony. And I think all of us think that pre-check is a very important program for the public and access. But uh, the ex to the extent we do have a category of individuals that it has grown exponentially, uh, that is being used that may not go through the entire vetting process, um, if you could share with us what you're able to share here what you think would be better in terms of some reforms to focus the pre-check process properly so that we really are um, allowing the members of the public to use it that should and still maintaining a, a thorough vetting of the individuals we should? The, the basic process or the basic principle behind pre-check is great because it is sort of this idea that if you're a known traveler, we have to spend less time on you than your unknown travelers. So really bringing pre-check back to its basic form, which is we know who you are. Um, we wrote this report. Uh, we've briefed members of Congress. Um, there is proposed legislation in the House of Representatives called the Securing Expedited Screening Act, uh, H.R. 2127, which basically directs TSA to bring it back to what it used to be, which is somebody looks at you and knows that you're a trusted traveler, as opposed to some of these risk rules that they now apply. Right. I also wanted to follow up. Um, we heard a lot of discussion today uh, about the the vetting process. But one thing, because I also serve as the chair of the aviation subcommittee, that's been an issue is the CIDA badges and wanting to fully understand from all of you your perspective on uh, T 
TSA's role in issuing CIDA badges, many of them are not being kept track of, and that responsibility is left to the local airports. Uh, is this what would you assess in terms of this issue? Is that a potential vulnerability? And what recommendations do you have in that front? <coughs> to whomever would like to answer it, I appreciate it. Sure. Um, well, so let me just start by saying that it is the airport's responsibility. And there are mechanisms that they have in place at the airport level to do regular checks with each of their contractors to make sure that the badges can be accounted for. And I believe that there is a, um, a trigger, like a 5% trigger, if a certain number of the badges have been lost, then they would all be reissued. So um, there are some controls in place, but I think that it is an issue that warrants additional attention. We are doing some work on that, uh, given sort of the news that has been sort of recently out there. Right, we've Atlantic. had some other incidences with the CIDA badges. Uh, exactly. So deep concern. We are doing field work right now with regard to that, uh, sort of being able to, to actually go to the sites and figure out whether or not the airport authorities are uh, appropriately and properly uh, uh, accounting for the CIDA badges, whether or not TSA is doing their oversight responsibility in a prudent way, and frankly doing some testing to see whether or not we can piggyback back into secure areas and those kinds of things. Thank you. We also conduct tests where we will um, call the airport and report that an employee has been terminated to determine how quickly they turn off the access according to the badges. Um, that was a special emphasis uh, inspection activity that we did recently. While we found a couple of challenges, in most cases when the badge was reported as lost or missing, the airport did turn off the access associated with the badge. Right. I thank all of you for being here. This is an important topic. And let me just say to uh, Chairman Johnson's point, I, you know, I, I've, I've certainly the TSA agents that I've interacted with in Manchester on a regular basis, um, I think they're very hardworking. And so putting together the right process for the people who are trying to do this job effectively every day and making sure that they have our support. I think is important, and then also um, ensuring that those are doing those agents that are doing well are empowered to do their job. I, I think that's part of our function here as well. So thank you all. Thanks, Senator Ayotte. Uh, Senator McCaskill. Uh, 